Oh yeah. That's some of those lo-fi beats there for you. <laughs> I've heard I've heard the kids like the lo-fi. Welcome back to another episode of the Painfully Honest Tech Podcast, where we every week do everything that we can to be both painfully honest and talk about tech. Uh, we succeed most of the time, I believe. Uh, our our guest host this this week with me is the one and only Andrew Scott, better known as Podcastage on the YouTubes. Thank you for being here, sir. Say hello to the people. Yes, thank you for having me on here. Always a pleasure to chat with you. It's been a couple of years, I think, yeah, since we yeah. last did a podcast together. So happy to be back and happy to top top painfully honest tech, yeah, and talk it too. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, this is it, it, this is the weird season for tech where like there's not a ton of stuff really going on. Everybody's on vacation. Uh, we could complain about the Pixel Fold if we wanted to, but. Yeah, you know, I've I've already done that, uh, but yeah, it's it is a it is a good it is a it is a good season to kind of stretch out and talk about you know more existential things, and perhaps we'll do that this evening. We do okay. we do have some stuff. Apple is uh, is has just announced that they are coming up with their own AI tool, their own generative AI tool. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, then. Apple also, in, in tech product news, just released the Beats Studio Pro yesterday. And uh, there's a lot of talk about what that means for the AirPods Max. So we can have some conversation about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, beyond that, let's see. What do we got? We got um, you know, AI is kind of dominating the conversation here because... We've got SAG-AFTRA and, and we've got the Writers Guild of America both striking and AI is a big component of that. So we're going to talk about that. And then we, we, might, we might kind of pivot over and talk a little bit about this uh, Miranda Lambert scandal where she had the temerity to tell people who were taking selfies and not paying attention to her in the front row to stop doing it in the middle of the song. Uh, so we can talk about the... The decorum of uh, public public presences, and whether or not who's who's most entitled <laughs> to to their behaviors, poor or otherwise. So yeah, man, how how have you been? What's been going on? Nothing much. I have just been keeping my nose to the grindstone, making videos, talking about microphones, testing microphones, and hopefully helping people understand microphones so they can waste less money. Yeah. That's really all I've been doing. I don't have time to focus on anything else between the day job and that. I mean, honestly, like and I've said, I've said this to you before, and I've, I say it to other people when I talk about when I talk about audio gear. Uh, your channel is by far the most comprehensive channel in terms of like what you go over in a review of a microphone, but then the sheer number of microphones that you've covered uh, is such a such a huge resource for people to to be able to go and really get a sense of what these microphones are capable of and how and compare them one against the other which is a big deal i mean cuz you yeah. you know you can spend a little bit of money or you can spend a lot of bit of money and yeah. you know maybe not get the results that you're looking for either way so <laughs> I, I i think that's something that a lot of people need to realize i've been pretty vocal about it there may be a difference between a $50, a $150, $1,500, and $10,000 microphone. And you may notice it as the person doing the recording, but for 99% of the people listening, they won't notice and they don't care. Right. It's yeah. all about getting a tool that makes your job easier. Yeah, and I think, I think ultimately, for me, my experience in doing this, you know, and, and having been an audio person, musician, et cetera, et cetera, for many years before I got into this YouTube game is like, it, there's a couple of things about microphones that I think to the, the, the newbie microphone purchaser, they, you wouldn't think for, one is yes, you can get a, you can get a cheap mic, but if you spent four times the cost of that hundred dollar mic, you would only spend that money once as opposed to spending a hundred dollars three or four times. Uh, yeah. and so that, that, that affects like your ability to have confidence in your, in your tools that they're going to yeah. work when you need them to work. 
but then also, I mean, I, I have a category of mics that I call forever mics. Okay. Uh, the SM7B being one, uh, the RE20, you know, a lot of, a lot of broadcast dynamic mics. And then of course, like the, the Neumanns and the Neumann. Hello, <laughs> Neumann. <laughs> I've never done that before. I don't know why. I just did that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rubbing off on you, and a little bit of Jerry Seinfeld is rubbing off on you too. Yeah, Hello, yeah. Neumann. <laughs> the AKG 414s, the 240, the 251s. You know, there's there's all those mics out there that, you know, you, you could buy a car, you could buy the microphone. Um, and again, like each one of those mics, you know, you could spend a lot on a pair of shoes, but if they don't fit. So yeah, what you do on your channel, I think, is is sort of an unsung, an unsung kind of service that uh, people who who've watched your channel for a long time appreciate. But uh, but I, I just like to put in the plug for those who who might be interested in that kind of stuff and looking for real well, information you. and not just sort of glazing over the specs <laughs> on the box. <laughs> well, that means a lot coming from you. Thank you. Yeah, man, for sure, for sure. <clears throat> So, so the first thing that we got going here is, um, well, the, the, the articles from Bloomberg talking about Apple coming up with their own AI. Now, for those who aren't like super familiar with this whole AI conversation, ChatGPT came out and then Microsoft bought it and put it into Bing and AI is just like coming out everywhere. And so Apple's now going to come out with their own. Uh, they're quietly wor- the, the Mark Gurman's article says they're quietly working on artificial intelligence tools that could challenge open AI, alphabets, uh, AI stuff, and others. But the company has yet to devise a clear strategy. This sounds familiar to me. <laughs> when I hear this, I just think, "Oh, Siri." Exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking too, because I remember when Apple bought Siri, I believe it was like 2009 or something, just like an, ages ago. And the the thought of a, a virtual assistant inside of your phone who could like do things for you was great. And then we got Siri and like, she can't look up things on the internet. Right. Like, what are you doing in there? And Apple has let Siri languish inside of all of their devices. And some things have gotten better. Some things have not. But I've never actually developed a developed a relationship with Siri that has uh, in any way become significant in my life. Uh, and, and maybe that's like an old man thing, you know. No, no, I, I, I'm in the exact same boat. I have been using iPhone since the 4S, the first iPhone with Siri, if I'm remembering correctly. I so, yeah. And I can't remember the last time that I have used Siri because it's worthless, yeah. at least for me. I have found no valuable use cases for it. So I'm seeing this, maybe they'll blow our minds, but I'm not holding my breath. Yeah, I... I mean, Apple does a lot of things really well, and and usually they do th- a lot. Of, they do whatever they do really well after they think about it for a long time and watch other people fail. <laughs> so, so you know, I'm I'm kind of wondering where they get into this. They, you know, usually what Apple tries to do, or at least they have in the past, is to see the thing that they want to make find the little startup company that is starting to do it and then they buy it <laughs> and and they that's what they did with siri they've done it with a lot of things they tried to do it with dropbox which is a really, really? interesting story yeah that so they tried to buy dropbox steve jobs this is famously a, a steve Jobs story he tried to buy dropbox and they told him no but he was so he was so sure that he was going to get it that he had already planned iCloud and everything around the concept of Dropbox. So <laughs> when they said no, if you remember when iCloud came out, it was not very good and not what it was sold to us as being. And I think a lot of that was because they didn't get the the IP that they wanted 
in order to make it do the thing that they wanted it to do. But I haven't heard anything about Apple trying to trying to purchase an AI startup or anything like that. <clears throat> and AI is such a slippery little weasel right now. I, I we we've talked about this offline, but I uh, but I use AI for my channel in several different ways. I've used it to help me generate like bullet point ideas and then not use them because I found that my brain is more is more uh, gifted at coming up with ideas than AI is. But you know, sometimes you can say, say give it a prompt to say like, give me ten titles around this. I've tried that. Hmm. Um, but where I've really had success that's really helped me with my channel is uh, a. There's a service called Gling AI, and Gling is an AI tool where you upload like your your A roll video, and it takes it in and it it processes it. And then you press a button, and five or ten minutes later, it spits out, it spits out a final cut document that has cut out all of the bl all of the blank spaces, all of the I wow. start start over, all of the all of the stuff where, you know, in in the course of recording a video, I will deliver a line two or three different ways, or I'll uh, you know I'll. I'll say something and try and get a trying to get it to roll off the tongue a little bit better. You know, I'll, I'll need to you know look at something for a minute before I before I speak again. And having to manually go through and chop all that stuff up is easily enough, like an hour's worth of work. Yeah, and and so within 10, 15 minutes, I can upload to Gling, and it will do a really really good job of basically doing that rough cut for me and it is it has saved so much time for me in terms of editing videos uh I interesting used to, i used to pay somebody to do that rough cut for me and gling is like well if you're a youtuber you can put their their little their little contact blurb in your description and get one free video so they is do... that one free video every time you plug them or is it just you get one free video yeah, what you have to do For is you have to you have to plug it into the description of an already existing video and then tell them what video it is, put in the URL, and then they scrape the the metadata of that mm -hmm. to see if it's in there and then they say, "Okay, you can do this." Or you can see, pay 15 bucks a month. <laughs> see like I'm hearing this and it sounds wonderful. It's awesome that these tools exist to help save time. Perhaps I'm just a luddite. Or maybe I just wear too many tinfoil hats, but I start thinking, what are they doing with all that, all of the footage? What are they going to do? Are they going to blackmail me because I, I said, ah, gosh, darn it. And then they're saving that and saying, oh, let's wait. We're going to use this against him. Yeah, so I'm just um, too paranoid, but <laughs> so I personally wouldn't use it. With the evil overlord that is so clearly out there. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All I know is my goal this year was to get more videos done and and to work more quickly to do that. And Gling has like really helped me out. And, no, that's fantastic. And it's it yeah, it just makes it like I just it's magical. Like you just open up the document that it gives you and then it pulls in the video file, but already cut on the timeline. That's great. And <laughs> All of the all of the information is still there. So if it didn't quite get the thing that you wanted it to get and it gave you something else or it cut off something because you were being dramatic and left too long a pause or whatever, you can always like scroll that back out and, yeah. and get the pieces that you want. But that's a heck of a lot easier than you know spending 30 to 60 minutes doing that rough cut. And I know I, I know some people, yeah, whenever people ask me like how long does it take you to make a video? And I'm like, anywhere from two to four hours. And mm -hmm. then there are some people who's like, it takes me seven days. <laughs> <laughs> what? So, so I mean, for them, I, I don't even know what they're doing. To be clear, I came to doing video uh, as an audio engineer. <laughs> so... So my my visual acuity when it comes to to video editing is is not my 
is not my strength. Yeah. I feel, yeah. I, I don't understand. It's possible that I just don't have that same creative mindset as them where I want to make a review of an SM7B, a narrative story with a beginning, middle, end, and then there's a cliffhanger and then I bring them back in and re-engage them. I'm not thinking of it that way. So maybe that's why. But it'll take me 20 hours between everything. Right. That's but all the do, testing. You do a lot of stuff. Yeah, that that's the testing. It'll take me two hours to edit my videos and that's because I have 40 clips. Right. But yeah. And I guess it's, you know, it's, it's all in what, what goes into it. I mean, I generally talk out my ass on the camera <laughs> and, and then I, and then I cut it up. Um, but that's the, I've, I think I've seen this, this, the storytelling, like the visual storytelling aspect of it. I've seen some people do it really well and I totally understand it, but I don't, I don't yet have the ability to, to think that way. Right. So, so yeah, I, but Gling has, has made it a huge difference. And then every, the pressure now it, to put out short, short clips and, and vertical video and all that kind of stuff is, is huge because even, even YouTube itself says uh, our, our good friend, Renee Ritchie, I heard him say this on a podcast. He, uh, the statistics are showing that the channels that do a mix of short and long form videos are the ones that tend to be doing better right now. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't dis I don't dislike short form videos. They can they can be really fun, but trying to create original short form videos and edit those and then edit your long form videos and all that kind of stuff. I found this uh, I found this service called Munch and hmm. again, you upload a long form video or you give it the URL of the video and you kind of give it some guidelines. You want it to be YouTube short. You want, to, you want it to be edited for YouTube shorts. You want it to be, you know, as much as 50, 50 seconds or 30 seconds or whatever. And then, um, and then you sort of just say go. And it says, we'll be done in 39 minutes. It's always 39 minutes. <laughs> and 39 minutes later you go to you go back to the munch page and it's given you like 15 different potential clips with <clears throat> like an analysis of the 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 SEO and and all that kind of stuff to say like here's a this this has a, a trending topic and it you know it even gives you a score for like how comprehensible it would be to someone watching it out of context mm hmm so, I mean, and it does a pretty good job. It gives you like 10 or 15 seconds on either end to sort of stretch it out a little bit if you, if you feel like you need to. But of those 15 or so clips that I get from a video, there'll at least be three, four, maybe even five that I could choose to turn into a short. And, and I, the way that I look at shorts on YouTube is like, it's not, they aren't part of my long form video strategy. You know, mm. like the, the way people consume short form video is, is entirely different. So I'll chop those things up and maybe the people who see it as a short form video never had it like the other, the longer video never crossed their path. Yeah. Right? So I, I had a few thoughts about shorts and AI. The first reason I started thinking about this is I am sure you as a YouTuber have gotten these emails. Hey, we want to help you grow your channel. We'll edit shorts for you. Right. I get five of those a day. Yep. I looked at one of them. They had actually created a short. They had actually edited the entire thing and uploaded it. And then my thought was, there's no way they're email blasting thousands of channels and editing them. Either yep. they have slave labor or they're using AI. So yeah. I assume they're doing AI. And for me personally, it's going to be different content strategies for every person. But again, maybe I'm a Luddite. This, I don't think this would work for me because I tried shorts. Every single time I made one, I really wanted it to be unique to that. And that right. could just me be having to overcome that barrier. Because as you said, a lot of people who watch shorts only watch shorts. The long form video viewers probably aren't watching. 60 second videos right. so maybe that's something that i have to overcome but 
I feel as though it's lacking that human touch. So as far as AI generation for short form content or video content, the way that I would approach it is trying to get some video ideas or as you do the SEO, the titles, the descriptions, stuff that might improve the distribution of it a bit better. Right. That's where I think it would be most interesting as a content creator. Yeah. And you know, even even so I I have a TubeBuddy account and for those of you who don't know, TubeBuddy is like a browser extension that you can put into Chrome or other browsers. And and it gives you some assists when doing SEO optim- optimization and other things. And they now have like this little AI title tool where you press the button and then it pops out this little thing and, it, and you say, give me some suggested titles. And it'll sort of remix. You have to have like a halfway decent title to begin with. And then it'll, you know, give you 10 selections of like a remix of, of that title. And, and maybe three out of five times, I'll be like, yeah, that's better than what I got, I think. And, and so I'll use it. I think that I also have noticed that a lot of people are using AI to write news stories. Okay. <laughs> um, especially, well, I, I mean, maybe it's just that I read tech bloggy type news stories more often than I read other stuff. But I have noticed a pattern in a lot of tech writing since AI has become more of a thing where the, the pattern, the almost like the diction and tone and voice are recognizable enough to me as like an AI generated thing that I think people people are like it's a gold rush for content right now. It's like more mm-hmm. content, more content, more content. I can only make I can only like naturally create so much. So, you know, write me an article that talks about Apple's new AI. Right. <laughs> and and I've done that. I did that several times to see what I would get. Like write me a blog post about whatever tech subject. Uh, giving me th- the top three reasons why someone might buy this product. And you get that. But hmm. it, it just, it it reads, it, I don't know. So, it's so like the Uncanny well, Valley for it, writing. Exact, exactly. So just like with the artificial voices, just like the artificial video, with right. artificial writing, you still have that Uncanny Valley. Right. Either they're a terrible writer <laughs> or it's a robot. <laughs> Well, and the thing is, like, even a terrible writer would 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 give themselves away as a human being eventually, mm-hmm. right? Um, but the structure of these articles is is such that you can tell that they want to get as much as possible out of what is essentially a title and a sentence. Okay, <laughs> so it's just pure fluff. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I worked at a newspaper and did, did some journalism things over the years. And so, you know, they, the AP, well, the Gannett style of journalistic writing was the inverted pyramid, right? You start out with the big idea, the thing that everybody wants to know, and within, and you get all that done in the first three paragraphs, and then you just whittle it down to more and more and more detail to the end hmm. of the pyramid, right? So, what that does for the for the editorial staff is you know that everything after graph number five you can delete okay you don't have to read it (laughs) you just know (laughs) that you know if you don't have the space for that then you you can get rid of it but also if you have a big box to fill and you need something then you have it right so so this is kind of the same thing but these these little articles will go into like the deep deep details of like where this piece of technology began and what its history was and all this other stuff and all you want to and i've seen this with with movies too like you know they it's always something like marvel has cast a new spider-man and you read through all of the history of like all of the tom holland spider-man right Mm -hmm. and then you get down to the last paragraph and it's one sentence and it says so at some point they're going to have to recast Spider-Man. 
So there's no information in the article. No, none. So instead of being an inverted pyramid, it is a plate on a pin. It's it's like a, it's like a jar of marshmallow fluff. Okay. <laughs> you, just, you dig your way to the bottom. You're sick by the time you get there, and there's nothing there's nothing to satisfy you. <laughs> so, so and but I know that that's what's happening because these things fill up my my little Google feed, and yeah. I found that like I I subscribe to. Was it Apple One? Is that what they call it? With all the different services oh, yeah. that I have. And so I get News Plus, and I have my own issues with News Plus, but I find that they are much better curated than like the Google feed that I get in my browser or whatever. And and nothing's as bad as uh, Microsoft Edge. The <laughs> news stories that come up on Microsoft Edge, it's like the stuff, it's all the stuff that's at the bottom, the paid stuff that's at the bottom of an article like lists of things or you know donald trump said something crazy but it's that's like the they're that's their above the fold on on microsoft edge gotcha uh, so i maybe i pay too much but back to back to ai in general i think it can be very very useful and i think it's all in there's two things that i that i'm coming to understand one, right now, it can't do what everybody says it can do. Um, it, it can't write an article for you. And so you, you shouldn't rely on it for content generation, right? However, yeah. you can rely on it for all of the other jobs that you would pay someone for. Like I used to be a proofreader and a copy editor. And, you know, I worked all of those like lower echelon publishing jobs, right? Graphic designer, all those things, did all that stuff. Um, it would be very hard for me to get a job as a 20 year old trying to do those things now because yeah, I, they don't I, exist. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 But you go, you go. I think that a lot of what AI is or what it can be used for is similar to audio plugins. Right. There are people who look at an audio plugin and think, amazing, I don't have to put in any work, I can record the worst sounding audio and this plugin will fix it. I saw that when I did some coverage of the Adobe podcast AI, Right. the processing. Yeah. I said, this sounds terrible, listen to it. The voice is an uncanny valley. It adds some text to speech level yeah. sound to it. This is terrible. Yeah. Do not use this unless you have to. And then I got some pushback saying, I use this on every single video. I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, more power to you. Do whatever you want. I think we have this exact same issue with the content generation side of AI. People should be using it as a, as a supplemental tool, but they're using it to replace themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, or to try and like carbon copy like lesser versions of themselves just to create i you know it can it can be a boon to a content as like a solo content creator to like for me I, i'm using it to take away things that would take me more time and i'm getting something that's at least that's it you know that's at least good enough to be the thing but it's not my main thing so i'm using it as a as an ancillary to my main thing and it keeps me from, ha you know, it, it shaves tons of time and yeah. I, you know, I don't have to pay somebody else to do it. I mean, I'm paying, I'm paying Munch $50 a month and Gling $15 a month. And, and I get, this is the thing. I'm skilled enough because I've been doing it for long enough that I can look at what it spits out and I can say it's lacking this or it's lacking that it feels right or it doesn't feel right. Whereas uh, I, I think that's the big thing. You're going to have to know how, like how to do this. You're going to have to know how to, how to do whatever it is that you're doing. Like if you ask, if you ask chat GPT to write you uh, an article about something that you're only moderately knowledgeable about, and then you publish it, like I had, chat gpt write me an article about whether or not so i i got a 
I got a Mac Pro, like a 2013 Mac Pro, the trash can. And I said, write me, write me an article about whether or not, like the pros and cons of the 2013 Mac Pro in 2023, right? And it did it. And the points were pretty much what you would expect them to be. But some of the like detailed history and information in there was like wrong. Right. <laughs> and, and I like if I didn't know as much as I know about Apple computers, I might not catch that. So so I think it's just it's incumbent on anybody who uses those tools to say like okay so I have to be like the buck stops here I have to make sure that it's actually doing what I need it to do and and that's the thing like Apple has sort of gotten into a little bit of AI it's not very well publicized yet I mean iOS 17 is is only it's in public beta now which means in the next, probably by September, October is when it will be released along with the iPhone 15. But I've had it, I've had it since the developer betas came out and I've, you know, I've been fooling with it, but people who d dig deeper have found things like Apple. And I saw, I saw a short from MKBHD who might be making the best shorts of any tech YouTuber out there because they deliver mm -hmm. almost as much information and knowledge as his regular long form videos they are just shorter but he also has he also has a staff of like 10 people so, yeah <laughs> so you know he's he goes up he reads the script that somebody else wrote that he approved and then he's got the cameraman and then he's got the editor and, and so i mean more power to him because that's the way you're supposed to do it if you if you can yeah more, hire more hire to, the best people delegate yes that's the way you should do it if you can afford to do it that way but uh, he he mentioned he, he made this this short that said, okay, Apple has this new feature where you can go into the you can go into the settings and you can go through about a half an hour's worth of voice prompts where you say back mm. to it what it is saying. And then you go to bed and you wake up in the morning and it has recreated your voice that you can then use on your iPhone. And he was playing back some of the examples and uh, and it had a slight robotic tinge to it, but it did sound like him. <laughs> oh, he's getting the tinfoil hat out now. Oh yes, now, now the tinfoil hat is on, yeah. Yeah, so um, that's, and it was pretty impressive. And it's only going to get better. Like this is a, a feature in a beta OS release. So yes, the overlords can mimic us uh, now. <laughs> and, and, you know, maybe, maybe it'll be fine. <laughs> maybe it'll be fine. Um, but then again, I, I was a huge fan of cyberpunk science fiction for, for many years. William Gibson, I talked about him last week on the podcast. He gets another shout out this week. One of my favorite writers of all time. He presupposed so much of stuff that's only starting to happen now. Uh, last week, we were talking about Ready Player One, which, you know, with the Apple Vision Pro, I mean, Ready Player One was basically that, you know, and people lived inside of that, that goggle. Right. I forget what they called it, but they had, you know, and they had virtual worlds and all that. But now we're getting to the place where with within a very short period of time, because really like chat GPT and all this stuff, we only really started talking about it like in February. Yeah, this is about six months. Yeah. And it's and, crazy. And it's just it's exponentially just growing and growing and growing and growing. And, and you know. On one hand, I'm like, this This is great because it opens up so many possibilities for, you know, mere mortals to to have more power at their fingertips to do things. Like your, your point about, like, audio plugins. So a guy who produced a record that I made back in 2000. <coughs> excuse me. Oh, boy. His name was, his name is Dave Amos. And uh, he's a keyboard player. He's incredible musician great producer uh actually built lenny kravitz home studio 
And, oh, wow. And sourced like all of this vintage gear from like actual real places. And he also was half of Bomb Factory. And Bomb Factory was the first company that made some, but that made realistic reproduction, reproductions of ancient gear. <coughs> um, so, and they sold it all to DigiDesign for Pro Tools. This was back before Avid had bought DigiDesign. And so Bomb Factory plugins came loaded in Pro Tools. And so you could use an 1176. Uh, you could use an LA2A. You know, it was very, it was the very basic, like sort of everybody uses these things in the real world. We've just figured out a way to recreate them. Going from there to where we are with, say, like Universal Audio, you know, and and what they've been able to do with with recreations of just about every piece of vintage gear that you could ever think of in plug-in form. And then, you know, that we were talking about. I just purchased the uh, the Universal Audio Sphere DLX microphone, which creates incredibly detailed and accurate representations of mics that cost thousands and thousands of dollars like priceless mics mics that you could not buy prohibitive yeah mics. i mean like they're 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 u67 model i think you could go into like abbey road or mm. or some other major studio that's had that microphone for 60 years and they right. just, you know they've got people there on staff to like keep it working but yeah, so it, th those are things that, you know, when it first happened, I remember being like, uh, I don't know, that's, uh, I'd rather pay $250 per reel of two inch tape and $800 a day studio time than use this facsimile of the thing. But fast forward from 2000 to 2023, I think what i've learned is the same the same kind of thing that we're talking about here it's a it's a tool and it doesn't it doesn't really matter if it's exactly like the thing that it's modeling what matters is that you can get the character of the thing that it's modeling and then you can use that and your own knowledge and experience to shape it into something that does what the other thing was intended to do. I think that holds true for stuff like emulation of audio gear, but once you're trying to emulate a human, it has to be imperceivable, that difference. Yeah. I, yeah. It's not gonna be successful until, well, I can't say, it, it already is incredibly successful. I don't think it will be this ground breaking thing that everybody thinks is going to be until it actually does make people believe or forget oh right. this was written by an ai oh this was edited by an ai yeah the editing may already be done they, yeah. they may already be there i mean it's it's an extension of you know grammar and spell check right uh, and i've come to trust spell check enough a grammar check can't read for context so you know but maybe it can now i just i was I, I never used it and i was told my students never to use it yeah i've but never yeah, used I, it either i think i think that i think that there are going to be ancillary jobs that ai can do really successfully and i think there will be people who utilize it to do things that they shouldn't do with it you know like the beatles are coming out with a new Beatles song that is in some way helped to completion by AI. I don't exactly know what, what that's going to look like or how that's going to work, but it's happening. And it happened because somebody in their bedroom took AI and took like a, a demo, I think it was a demo of a John Lennon song, and then instructed the AI somehow to make it sound like the Beatles on the recording. And I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> well, I'm not going to hold my breath on that one. I listened to it and I was kind of like, 
okay, that's better than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It had the harmonies. It had the, it had the right kind of, the right kind of feel in, in terms of structure and the way they, the way they use the guitar parts and the bass parts and all that kind of, so so it, it had definitely somehow studied the structure of a Beatles song enough to be able to recreate it in its spirit, I guess. Um, And so the Beatles are, Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr are doing something and it's going to come out as a Beatles recording, I guess. And I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. They've, they've gone on record saying, well, we would never use AI to recreate John's voice or George's voice or, you know, anything like that. But we can use this as, as a way to fill the, we'll just have to wait and see. But I, I think we said the same thing whenever they came out with the anthology, the Beatles anthology with two new songs on it. Hmm. And, and people were like, well, it's not the real Beatles. John Lennon's dead. But they used a, they used a demo and then they used, you know, Jeff Lynn and some ancient computers to like turn it into an actual Beatles song. And, but it, but at the same time, it's like, did they really? Yeah, I'm going to reserve judgment on it. I'm not holding my breath, but I don't want to be that person who says, oh, I hate it because it's new. I want to see what it does because it's undeniable if AI progresses or when it does progress and develops, it will be an amazing tool. It will help people accomplish stuff and actually convey their ideas their ideas hopefully more clearly and more effectively. And that's amazing. So I don't want to say I hate it. I just doubt it's going to be there just yet. I doubt it'll be there yet, but maybe. Yeah, but you know, what's the doubling time of the capabilities of AI? If it's gone from chat GPT can like, can can write you a five paragraph essay in February and now, Now it's making Beatles songs. Um, well, is it ChatGPT that's doing that? I, I don't know exactly what what AI strain they they've used, but and I I think I'm doing what a lot of people do where I just use ChatGPT as like a a shorthand okay catch all for all AI right <laughs> right yeah which which isn't isn't accurate but it's I think what most people are familiar with and so yeah but it's it's probably not that but it's something that's in the same in the same vein what really worries me is when ai becomes so good that it is to the naked eye ear everything else indistinguishable from the real person how do we know i i guess the follow up question would be does it really matter well that's and that's a good question because I I think at some point we're going to hear people talking about uh, having some kind of identification system, whether it's like embedded serial numbers or or something like that in code that can be detected or something like that. I think once, but once it becomes indistinguishable from reality, then does it become reality or do we have to be able to distinguish it? So I guess the the question would be like, why would we need to be able to distinguish it other than the, the nefarious uses? Right. The nefarious uses, oh, we're going to make a deep fake or a fake video of this person doing this one thing. That's right. a nefarious use. But as far as entertainment, as far as writing, as far as online content creation, why would it really matter as long as the person consuming the video or the yeah. the audio is getting what they're looking for does and, it need to be distinguished and i think the the interesting like sort of striking point for that discussion has been the writers guild and sag aftra strikes in hollywood over the potential use of ai for writers i mean obviously writers the writers are saying, you know, we we aren't a, just a, 
a content generation machine. Like we have these complex brains and, and the ability to work with one another in order to come up with these stories that, the, that you then use to create content. That's a valuable thing. We need some assurances that you won't, you won't try to replace us with that in order to, you know, to, to cut out a certain cost from your bottom line. Right. Yeah. I. I so I. Th I don't think there really should be any law. Maybe I shouldn't say this, but I doubt that AI would ever be able to truly replace a writer because my understanding of it is it's trained on existing data sets. Right. So it's going to base all future creations off those existing data sets. My understanding is that wouldn't really allow for these new groundbreaking ideas. And, and that's thing, what so many people are looking for. They want to be challenged. They want something they haven't seen before, not right. just a regurgitation of the same story over and over and over again, which is what we've gotten already. But, uh, you know, <laughs> up until up until recently, where that's proven to be less of a bankable strategy, you know, as, as we see comic book movies sort of start to falter and paint by numbers, films, uh, not really performing and you know like if when Top Gun Maverick was announced and I saw the initial trailer which was like three years before it came out mm -hmm. I was like I watched the original Top Gun in the theater and other than nostalgia I remembered being just a piece of crap <laughs> <laughs> so how could this 30 plus years later 40 years later be any good but like the people that made that movie captured a thing that captured the interest and the excitement and and whatever it is that gets you excited about movies and and made a great movie from it right absolutely and i never would have guessed that you know so sometimes sometimes lightning in a bottle sometimes lightning strikes or whatever silly lightning metaphor you want to use it happens but then you've got on the flip side of that the flash which for me like i love comic books and knowing the storylines that they were using to generate that content that could have been awesome and by all accounts it was not <laughs> i haven't seen right it but so but i think you're right i think that you know i think that that little thing inside of humans that creative thing that's that's i i can't think that that's reproducible in a, in, we, we, in a, we in haven't a, seen it yet yeah we haven't seen it yet there's no indication that it's reproducible so why would we expect it to be where it gets even more interesting though is in the sag after a strike and this one kind of took me sideways and I was kind of like, Oh, okay. Like Hollywood actors are going on strike. That seems odd. But then as, as I read about it and heard it explained more, I came to understand that it's really, it's not about like the Tom Cruises. Tom Cruise is not on strike. <laughs> you know, <laughs> hopefully he's in support of the people that are on strike, but it's the people who, you know, I, I heard it best described as like middle-class actors. Mm -hmm. people who might have a one line speaking part on a television show or you know fill in background on a television show or you know be a featured player in one episode of law and order you know what like those people who you may have seen in 10 different things and they they might be vaguely familiar but you can't for the life of you think of where you saw them right mm -hmm. those people are facing something that is clear and present a danger to them in the sense that they're sort of facing the possibility of being hired to show up, do like motion capture, and then be sent home with a one-time payment for their name, image, and likeness to then be reproduced by AI at will by the, by the movie studios or the television studios. And whether I, one time payment no residuals you know etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean this is all this is all contractual stuff but the potential to take an actor who 
is not known enough to be recognizable as fake and then use like put them in a scene doing business but it's not really them like, yeah this is something that that could happen now and would surely happen soon if they didn't have some sort of agreement in place right so yeah it sounds like it and actually like when you think about it i, I always think about science fiction but the new season of black mirror the first episode of the new season of black mirror is this weird sort of circular uh circular episode it's like salvador dalian in that the main character is being played by an actress uh the actress who annie murphy who was in schitt's creek um but we come to find out that she's like oh, the third generation of this version of the show because the previous version was salma hayek and then the previous okay. <laughs> like at some point it gets back to the real woman but it's just, it's like they're three generations down where all of these actors have sold their likenesses in in perpetuity to the studios so they could make these this tv show and, oh, okay and so and it becomes really bizarre because then they kill themselves by killing the mainframe or something <laughs> spoiler alert sorry <laughs> oh gosh no how am i going to survive <laughs> but i mean it's it's a real concern for crafts people let's say you know creatives who work on on a not so monumental worldwide scale yeah i i think they should be fighting to ensure that the contracts they sign don't include anything that's exploitative i think that's perfectly fair when i hear you describe it as they show up they get paid for the day they're there and they get no residuals i'm just thinking that sounds like my day job <laughs> sounds like what i do every single day yeah i know is I know. it are, are you going to oh gosh but just you still have to show up every day yeah, I still have to show up every day. Yeah, so yeah, it, I, I agree one hundred percent. Fight to get the contracts that are not exploitative. They do not own your likenesses, so that you can be replicated in perpetuity forever and ever universe at all times. Yes. Fight for that. Fight against that. Yeah, and and I think ultimately we would see, as we've seen with you know the paint by numbers creative stuff that's come out in 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 every genre of creativity. Um, those things would not ultimately satisfy. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know maybe we'll save ourselves a lot of a lot of crappy con like movies and TV shows by by working this out ahead of time. Uh, but yeah, it's but it is scary to think like and and then the con I was in a conversation yesterday where you know p the actors are I I guess I haven't seen it myself, but people have said that they're reaching out to online content creators like you and I saying, please don't cross the picket lines and make a movie, I guess. Or something. Like, um, like no, <laughs> I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm not, I'm not a part of your union just yeah, for the record. <laughs> that's what I, I mean, I feel for you and I support you trying to get what you deserve to get in order to, you know, protect yourself and your livelihood and your family. But I, you know, I'm not a dues paying member. Yeah, and I get no part of your industry. We get no benefits yeah. from the union. We have no collective bargaining. So if you're expecting us to actually take action and strike with you, why? What, I mean, what are we benefit? How are we benefiting from that? Are, and arguably, you can look at some creators like Mr. Beast. I would say that Mr. Beast is probably more popular worldwide than almost any TV show that's out there. I would agree with you, yeah. He was offered a billion dollars for his channel and turned it down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's unfathomable for me. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. And, and like, say what you want about whether, sometimes I think he leans too much on money as, as, like, a, as like a dramatic uh, tool to drive his content forward. Um, and sometimes he like it, it seems somewhat, you know, let them eat cake to me. But 
I, I don't know about that, but I I guess one thing that I saw last week was, you know, it was a tweet. It was a comment on this tweet and get the most likes and I'll give you all the money that I make. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I saw that <laughs> one. Yeah. <laughs> and something about that struck me as like one step over the the line. It's it's a bit bizarre. It's yeah. it's a it's a very strange relationship that he's developing with people, almost yeah. like a Willy Wonka kind of. Yeah. The, the, oh, I'll I'll give ticket. you your golden ticket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The golden in, ticket in that regard. Yeah. And so so, look, but I mean, when you think about content creators, I mean, one of the reasons that we became online content creators, or at least a lot of people did, is that there was no place for you in like the in the zeitgeist of mainstream media, right? And YouTube, so YouTube and other outlets suddenly gave us a platform to do the things that we wanted to do that, you know, we didn't have a platform for before. That nobody cared about. So yeah. we took the risk to do it on our own. And for those of us who've been able to become successful enough to, to, make, to make a decent living or at least to augment our wages and, and, you know, that kind of thing, when somebody says to me like hey do you want to be a scab actor for for the actors union uh, like I, I mean okay if you want to if you want to develop a television show with me like okay but if you just want me to come in and and be you know stand in on a on a soap opera like this no yeah so so i want some clarification because i didn't see any of this were they saying don't make videos online or were they saying hey if for instance if friends was still on right if the creators of friends came up and said hey jason will you come and be chandler this week because he's on strike are I, they I, saying don't do that or don't make videos online yeah i think it's it's more don't don't go into their their sphere and and cross that picket line and do their thing oh okay okay i thought they were saying stand in solidarity with us and don't make videos well and, and, and i so found that very offensive <laughs> yeah no, I, I mean <laughs> i can't afford to not make videos so can I, and yeah. I don't have a union that's that's gonna help me pay my bills when uh i'm but yeah i mean i think that this also highlights what is wrong in media and has been wrong in in mainstream media for decades now we saw it in the music industry we saw it in the publishing industry we've seen it in the in the film and television industry where the the television industry is no longer able to satisfy the desires of the people that they used to have as a captive audience right and the streaming services were able to to draw those people in but i mean even that's falling apart now because the streaming yeah. services are have quickly run out of ideas as well and so I think the only way forward for them is, is to really double down on creativity and, and finding new things as opposed to, you know, finding easier ways to make more money. That's what the record industry did. The record industry was like, okay, so we'll spend less on taking chances on more, more sort of risky things and we'll just mm -hmm. have a million in sinks. <laughs> right. Know, you know, that'll, that'll pay the bills. So they, they abandoned the, the structure or the idea of hiring or finding an Aerosmith and developing them over five albums. Right. It was just, we want Britney Spears' first album, millions of copies. Uh, we yeah. want Ed Sheeran' first album, millions of copies. Yeah, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> but Ed Sheeran is like a unicorn. I don't get it. I, like, how does he happen? Because I don't know. He's... I, I'm not a fan, but I appreciate like that in a, in a world where everything has become very cookie cutter, like he found a little niche in there. He just like sort of shoehorned himself in with a little guitar and a loop pedal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I've only heard one or two of his songs and I just say, oh, wait, that was him. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Really well done. Yeah. But I mean. But he's so he's so much the antithesis of like what you would expect from mm -hmm. mainstream music. But he he got it he got in there and and was able to make it happen. Um, 
but for every Ed, Ed Sheeran, you have, you know, a million people who sound exactly like somebody else who had a successful record last year. Mm-hmm. And and so I see. I think we see in the in the TV and film industry the same kind of thing starting to happen, where there's a dearth of ideas, and now the money is starting to run out. <laughs> and yeah, and uh, and so you, it's like, do I ride this thing into the ground, making as much money as I can, or do I like, do I grab myself by? I hate the bootstrap thing. It's been co opted by people that I don't like. But you know, but do I like? tighten the belt and and really double down on trying to make this thing special again. And the record industry didn't do that. Uh, no. the, publish, the publishing industry was a little bit weird because there's Amazon and, and everything else. But now we're, see, now we're seeing it in the big medias. Like the record industry is a big media, but movies and TV, that's like, that's like bread and butter. I, I think we're going to have to start to see more indie productions, more small budget productions, more interesting ideas that don't have $200 million visual effects budgets. And I think that will lead to a lot more interesting content. But as it stands right now, I agree. It is just a lot of the cookie cutter stuff. I This last week, I canceled the last subscription service that I have. I don't have any video streaming services. Netflix, Hulu. The last one was Shudder, okay. which is a horror streaming service. That was now the last one. The horror. It's gone. Yeah, I'm. I'm getting there. Like you know, so we we have our grandson. He's two, and you know, watching watching TV for a couple of hours and spending some time and just kind of you know vegetating after dinner is 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 a thing to do. And so I find myself watching a lot of streaming services. But I find myself, and I love true crime. And there's some true crime that is just like, you know, transcendent. Like I can't right. believe the human experience, <laughs> but I just got to witness in documentary form. Uh, and then some of it's like Lifetime, ID Network, like Pablum. And now, I, like, I'm down to the Pablum. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just, I, I keep searching i i go through netflix literally every day saying is there going to be something that they just released that will really be interesting for me to watch today yeah and nine times out of ten the answer is no so then when there is something i just watch it all that night <laughs> and 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 then i don't have anything so <laughs> I, I just i think that it's like the streaming services have become like, you know, in the nine in the eighties and into the nineties, we like had the whole 57 channels, but nothing on phenomenon when cable became a big deal. Right. Like they had to fill the space with content and, and there just wasn't enough content to fill the space. So I, yeah, I mean, AI is not going to, not going to solve that problem though. Yeah. Cause going back to the nineties, those TV series were 24 episodes long. And yeah. if you watch them, watch the full seasons, not just the best of, there are a lot of stinkers. Oh, yeah. So just the idea of generating more and more content to try to get something that sticks doesn't seem like it'll be effective because they've already lost the interest of people. Yeah. They've already lost the good faith that people had in them. Because the amount of people that I see saying, oh, these streaming services are garbage. There's no good content anymore. Right. I think they've lost it already. So they, I think instead of doubling down on massive amounts of content by lowering costs with AI, they need to focus on high quality content. Yeah. Fewer releases, higher quality. And, you know, one of the things that saved broadcast TV kept bringing people back as much as as much as it's much maligned reality television shows yeah and the reason that reality tv works is because at least there is the 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 sense of unpredictability you know that it's human interaction is going to cause something to happen that will eventually have an outcome right that's why people love to watch sports mm-hmm. you know every sports match whatever whatever it is that you're watching i mean the outcome is unknown until you get to that place and i think that's you know people have to have that same feeling about the the stories that they encounter in film or tv 
You know, that just reminded me of something. I don't know if we were talking about this off air or on the podcast, but that just reminded me of YouTube. Yeah. 2014, 2015 YouTube. Uh You had no idea what was going to happen. But now YouTube has become so... Mm -hmm. Sterilized is the wrong word, but just so predictable. Mm Mm-hmm. So inside the box, people don't feel that danger going on YouTube anymore. That's probably for the best, but at the same time, it lacks exactly what you're referencing now. That sense of danger, that sense of unpredictability. Yeah, you might you might just accidentally find a channel of somebody who you never would have seen anywhere before who's doing something that you never would have thought of anyone doing in that way. And and it's like and, and you get to be the thing that's great about YouTube is that you get to be part of it. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you get to jump on for the ride and, and follow that creator for as far as it goes. And I think, you know, in, in the tech space in 2017, 20, yeah, 2017, when I did the, can you trust series, a lot of the question that I was asking that I, the, a lot of the conversation that I thought was, something that I wanted to talk about and I thought might be good for the overall community was like, what are we really getting when we talk about, when we watch people talking about tech, are we getting individuals sort of relating their experience in an unvarnished way or is it starting to become advertisements and how much of that is okay? And you know, what I discovered in doing that series was it's different for each creator. However, I think it's it, it's really easy and probably very tempting to stay closer to the middle lane. There's more money in the middle. There's there's less controversy in the middle. And it's more it's more accepted now than it was five years ago. I I think it's more profitable in the middle if you are earning money from the brands. Right. But it is, I would imagine it is far more profitable being on the extreme edge if your revenue source is the audience. Right. Based on views, because we all know the more extreme the title, this is the worst phone ever released. This phone will kill your family. Right. That type of title will get the clicks over, hey, this new phone's pretty decent. Here's all the features. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a sexy title. That's not a sexy video. Nobody wants to watch that. Some people do. At the same time as, as, you know, being somebody who kind of went toward the, the, uh, the more dramatic side of it. I also found myself in in a position of becoming the boy who cried wolf, Mm. you know, and, and like getting tuned out because there were, you know, how, how many times could I say that, inciting thing about whatever like so it but i but i think that when i like i don't watch very many tech videos anymore right um i mean maybe it's because i you know it's it's kind of like if you were an accountant would you watch like excel spreadsheet tutorials (laughs) <laughs> only only if there's something that I need to do because I'm kind of an accountant. I'm like, oh, gosh, wait, how do I do this one this one function? OK, YouTube. OK, got it. Yeah. In exactly. that case. But I'm I'm not coming home thinking, you know what I really need right now? I need to watch some new late breaking Microsoft Excel news. Yeah. Yeah. Or like I can't wait to I can't wait to watch 10 videos about Lewitt's latest uh, <laughs> two microphone FET circuitry. Like, like, I now now I would watch that. <laughs> Absolutely watch that. I want that video. Lou yeah. it. If you're seeing this, make that video walking through the intricacies of the circuit design or lack thereof with right. the pure tube. Yeah. See, I, <laughs> I would I would love to see people like get way more geeky than is necessary about mm-hmm. about tech. And there are some channels that do that for sure. Yeah. Um but there are there are in many ways and this is true in the in like music and other things the channels that i watch there are so many channels that sort of just skim across the surface and you know that skimming across the surface leads the the viewer to the affiliate link in the description below 
And yeah. some of the, I mean, some of those people do it really well, and there is value in a lot of that content if you just really want to know the basics about a piece of gear or or a phone or a smartwatch or a whatever. You know, if you're if you're TV shopping, I don't need to see somebody like calibrate the TV. You know, mm-hmm. I, but I want to I want to be able to compare and contrast features. And so there's there's ways to do that, but I would I would love for there to be more channels where people are just just like going for it. And yeah, I, I I would love to see that in the audio realm. There are some great channels, by the way. Dan Worrell, you got Julian Krauss, yeah. just fantastic. Where they understand the audio engineering and the technical side of stuff so much better than somebody like me that they can present it in a yeah. A much more stomachal, stomachable and palatable way. Yeah. I understand I'm too stupid for a lot of this, so I just say I'm not going to put my foot in my mouth. I'm going to do what I can do. And in the background, I'm going to try to learn so I'm not as stupid for as long. <laughs> and eventually I'll get there. Yeah, and, and like Julian Krauss is a great example because, man, his all of his reviews are basically about like the the circuitry and like noise floor of the preamps yeah and and i'm just like okay this is presented to me in a way that is much more objective than anybody yes. else is doing it you know I, I i can see like the dips and 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 you know humps in the charts and understand as he explains it what they're relating to um and you know it's just it's just in youtube is a really interesting community because here's people that you know obviously are so they they self started whatever it is that they're doing they didn't get hired to make these videos right they they started doing it and it and it turned into a thing and i think that there was a time where that was more the case on youtube than it is now but, but you, as youtube has developed i think some people are seeing it as a career path yeah um, and now it's you know back in the day there was you know you could be in the basement with a bed sheet across the back of the the wall and you know make a drum tutorial and everybody would be like this is awesome <laughs> yeah but to bring it back to the original topic of ai i don't yeah. think ai would be able to say you know what'll do well on youtube doing objective reviews of audio interfaces where you verify the measurements and present them in a ranking format. An AI would never think of that. Right, right. An AI would never think, you know what a great YouTube channel would be? Testing out every single microphone that you can and giving demos. Right. (laughs) It would never think of that because it's a stupid idea. It's a stupid idea. (laughs) Financially, business-wise, it doesn't work. But... At the same time, a very valuable service. Uh, and it, because the individual is passionate about it and they care about it. Right. And that is the driving factor be t- behind people like myself, Julian, you, John Pross, any of these people starting our channels. The driving factor is passion and that spark and that drive. That's what the AI is missing. It doesn't right. have that human element, that spark. Yeah. That idea of this may seem stupid on paper, but I care about it so much that if I don't scream about it on the internet, I will explode. Yeah. That's no, what it's right. missing. You're right. Although I would like to see the AI version of John Prosser. <laughs> 10 out of 10. <laughs> if there's an AI John Prosser, John Prosser much, must shave his eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's I think that's a good place for us to, to wrap it up. We didn't get to the Miranda Lambert, but that's probably... Not, That's fine. Yeah, you know, you can talk about that on Facebook. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, but it's I think that I can fill hours with talking about the, the potential for this AI stuff because it is going to be like a generational like change. It's going to be something that yes. defines the next 50 years of our lives. And I just been really curious to see how or if we are able to like keep the collar on it and and hang on in a way that it doesn't get out of control i mean maybe we'll all end up like uh you know just permanent couch potatoes 
and AI will just do everything for us. Yeah, I just see, I look forward to that day. Like, give me a little bit of universal basic income and a recliner, and I am ready. For I'm the opposite end. <laughs> Leave me out of that world. I need to work. I need something to fill my time. No, I do too, but I. I <clears throat> What is is that Wally the movie? Wally, yeah, people, that's, yeah, that's what I was doing. On the ship, pop. and they just yeah, they're just like hovering around in these like in these giant <laughs> recliners that make smoothies for them. <laughs> that does sound pretty sweet on a weekend for on one day. Weekend. <laughs> on a weekend, maybe one day a week as a as a you know just a fun day. Yeah, but you know, anyway, Bandrew Scott podcastage. Thank you so much. Tell us where the, can the people find you for all the microphone information they could possibly ever want, and maybe a little Th bit more. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. For all my microphone and audio stuff, you can find that at podcastage.com. And for all of my other content, bandrewscott.com. Awesome. Two URLs, awesome. easy peasy. That's right. And that's Bandrew with a B. I discovered yes, that, uh, that autocorrect does not like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was like... I was like, no, I want that be there <laughs> it like five times. And then it changed it again before. I, uh, anyway, thank you, everybody, for watching so much. Uh, again, this is the Painfully Honest Tech Podcast. You can find me, Jason T. Lewis, at Painfully Honest Tech on the YouTubes, the Jason T. Lewis on the Twitters and elsewhere, JasonTLewis.com, PainfullyHonestTech.com, all those things. Otherwise, thank you so much for being here once again. Until the next time, we are out.